Okay, so I'm going to be talking about navigating uh, the technical skills shortage. Before I do that, a little bit of background about me and the company I work for. Um, I'm Ricky Dolphin. I'm the Chief Technology Officer with Cambridge Cognition. Uh, I've worked in medtech for uh, the last 30, 31 years. Uh, and uh, the company I work for, Cambridge Cognition, we're based out at Bottisham, or at least our headquarters are out at Bottisham. Uh, we have uh, operations over in Canada, down on the East Coast in Boston, and down in South Africa. Uh, and we are a neuroscience technology company. Uh, so we work with uh, pharmaceutical companies, research institutes, uh, biotechnology companies, and healthcare companies, uh, assisting them by providing the technology that enables them to do research into cognitive diseases. Uh, so those are things like uh, Alzheimer's, depression, schizophrenia, ADHD, and so on. Um, so uh, if you want to know more about what we do, by all means, come and talk to me afterwards, or you can go onto our website, uh, camcog.com, uh, and learn a little bit more about what we do. Um, but I'm going to be talking about navigating the technical skills shortage, uh, and uh, roughly speaking, my agenda is I'm going to uh, take a look But these, uh, basically, <laughs> first of all, is there a problem? I mean, maybe, maybe for you there's no problem whatsoever. Um, but for us, there was definitely a problem. Uh, I'm not the only person that thinks that. So first of all, we're going to take a look at whether or not we actually think there's a problem. Uh, and then I'm going to take a look at sort of five solutions and talk a little bit about my experiences of them. Uh, so these are all things that basically I've had to deal with. Uh, so good news for those in the room. If there is really a problem, my first solution is to pay you all more. Okay, it's great news. Here we are. Worth, worth every penny, so I'm going to look at pay more. I'm going to look at really, you know, when does it work, when does it not work, what are the limitations of doing that, um, and then some of the other things, terms and conditions, reskilling, contract resourcing, outsourcing, nearshoring, and offshoring. Um, pretty much the gamut of different things that we have in our armory uh, in order to tackle the problem. Okay. So, is there a skills gap shortage? Um, Basically, I, I kind of figured there was a problem because historically, and you know, by that I minute, mean, the last 12 years when I've been recruiting people into Cambridge Cognition, three to six months it's taken me to get the right people into Cambridge Cognition. You know, I, I know we're a scientific company and we're pretty picky about who we recruit in, uh, and, and that's not a problem taking three to six months, providing uh, you're in a situation whereby you don't need many developers. Um, the moment you need to scale your business. Uh, fairly rapidly, if it takes you three to six months to recruit one individual into the company, it just isn't going to work. Um, so for, for quite a while, it was okay, as long as we were thinking far enough ahead. We could recruit people in, we had low turnover, no problems at all. Um, however, as we began to grow as a business and we needed to scale up, it just wasn't working for us uh, in the Cambridge area. Um, and so we had to think about what are we going to be doing about this. And I started looking, well, is there really a problem? Is it a problem in us as a company? Uh, or is it actually a global uh, problem or a UK problem? Um, well, when I started looking at it, it became apparent that actually, do you know what? We're not the only people experiencing this problem. Um, and my first thought was we're just not producing enough people in the UK. There aren't enough people going into computer science. Uh, there's a fundamental grassroots problem. Um, and so I looked at the stats, uh, and that doesn't really, to me, appear to be the case. We're doing a pretty good job at actually encouraging people into the field. Um, so I've just picked out some figures. Uh, the references are down at the bottom if you want to have a look at the slides afterwards. Uh, so you can go and make sure I'm not making these figures up. Um, but essentially, yeah, uh, we are seeing a rise in the number of people coming in uh, at all levels. So from our computer science students... Uh, so increasing through uh, those doing A-levels, those going on to do uh, degrees uh, in the area. Uh, and basically, we are seeing a significant increase in the number of people coming through as computer graduates. So there's no shortage, particularly, of people wanting to come into the profession. It's not an image problem. Um, but the real problem is, is that demand is increasing, and demand is outstripping supply. So if you haven't got the problem right now, I'm afraid you're going to have to face, at some point you are going to have a problem getting people in. Uh, and it's not just a UK problem, uh, it is a global problem. Okay? So you're going to have to start dealing with strategies as to how are you as a company 
uh, actually going to solve that problem? How are you going to attract people into your company, uh, and where are you going to do that? So I'm going to present a few strategies, some things that I've tried. Um, so the first thing, of course, you've got to do is you need to think about, basically, here I am in the UK. I'm in the Cambridge area as a company. Um, Basically, if you've got a high turnover problem, why have you got a high turnover problem? Or if you can't attract people, if you're not getting people applying to your job uh, adverts, uh, what's, what's going wrong? Um, so one of the first things you want to do, of course, is you want to stop bleeding staff if you're losing staff. You want to do a quick benchmark. Salary. Let's look at salary. Everybody loves their salary increases. Um, so we looked at salary. Uh, we basically looked at... Uh, you know, do I pay people more? So you benchmark. So you go out there, you look at uh, things like Glassdoor, for example, uh, and you do some surveys and you basically look at the adverts and you see whether or not that matches what Glassdoor is saying. Uh, and then you compare that against the salaries you're paying. And then you figure out whether or not you're actually paying what you should be paying for your staff. OK, fantastic. I'll just now have got all the data I need. I just go and pay the staff more and that will solve my problem and I'll attract people in. There is a small problem, of course. Uh, going and paying people 40% more than they're currently on causes a problem potentially for your business. Uh, can you afford to do it? Uh, and it's not just about paying more for the people that are coming in. Uh, you can't just bring somebody on on 40% more than your existing development staff are being paid. That's going to cause problems because they all talk. Um, so basically, you're going to have to restructure your salary bandings and pay everybody more than you were paying before, uh, that's a fairly expensive business. Um, so that's a board level type decision, <laughs> uh, significant investments. But yeah, OK, so can we afford to restructure across the business? Uh, and the problem you'll then find is, of course, six months time, you're back where you started. Because in six months time, uh, everybody's got used to being paid what they're now being paid. And it's no longer working particularly well as a retention factor. Uh, and what happens is everybody else then starts their benchmarking and realizes, well, I tell you what, if we pay a little bit more than everybody else, we can attract people in and the salaries go up and then the benchmarking starts again and then the salaries go up and the benchmarking starts again. And it's just cyclic. OK, it just gets unmanageable. Um, so you've got to bear in mind that, yes, you need to be competitive, but pay is only one factor as to why people stay in a job. OK, it doesn't last long. Um, so you've got to look at what else you might be uh, doing. What else can you actually do? Well, the first thing to ask the question is, what is it that you do? You know, uh, you know I'm afraid to say if you're sitting there running uh, and what you do is you know, you're, you're doing gambling sites or uh, you're a gaming company, uh, or whatever else it is that you're particularly doing, the question you've got to th understand is, you know, what is it that's attractive about what we do? Why is somebody going to want to work for us as opposed to working for anybody else? All right, you've got to understand that. Um, so for us as a medical tech company, we're looking for people who actually want to make a difference in society. Um, that basically is the driver as to why people are going to come work for us. So you've got to know what it is that differentiates you from everybody else, and you've got to make sure you sell that to the people that are coming in. I'm not a recruitment consultant, by the way. I'm not being paid by Broadlight to do this. Um, but you've got to understand what it is that you do, what it is that's different. Um, the other things to look at is your internal culture. Do you have a problem in the actual uh, department or the company? Is there a positive culture? Do people like working there? Um, what's the management culture? Do you, ha you know, people don't work for the company. They work for their manager. Okay? So if you've got somebody that's really good at managing people and people respect, then they'll want to stay. They enjoy working with that individual. They enjoy working with the team. They're enjoying what they're doing. They're feeling like they make a difference in society. They're much more likely to stay long term. Career development. We heard Andy talking about their investment in career development. People want to be developing and advancing themselves. Okay? So you've got to make sure you're providing those mechanisms and work-life balance. I'm afraid if you're driving people into the ground, if people are regularly working 60 to 80 hour weeks, they're going to burn out and they're going to be no use to you. Uh, they're going to get fed up of it. They're going to want to go somewhere else. So you've got to create the right work-life balance, and none more so now in the post-pandemic uh, world, uh, where people's expectations are very different. So yes, pay is a major factor. If you're not paying uh, what the market expects to be paid, 
you're going to have problems recruiting staff. It's a simple fact. But there are a lot of other factors that go into that. Pay is not just one of them. So, yeah, by all means, look at your pay, do your benchmarking, make sure you're competitive, but look at all of the other hygiene factors that actually help people to stay uh, where they are and make sure you get those right. Other factors then, terms and conditions. I mentioned one of these, what you do actually matters, so that people work for managers, not the company, this work-life balance, um, flexible hours, part-time, hybrid working, remote working. Uh, remote working is a really interesting one. Every company, by the way, is struggling right at the moment to figure out what do we need in the office, uh, how often do I ask people to come in, uh, are we going to you know, change to an entire remote working culture and really, will it work uh, and how do we actually uh, make sure that people understand the culture of our company when we actually don't have offices and nobody's coming together. Every company is struggling with this right now. Nobody actually knows the answers. Uh, we'll probably begin to understand those. We'll probably see, a, you know, we've moved away to remote working. We were all forced to do it in the pandemic. We're coming back in. We've heard different opinions from the, some of the financial companies saying everybody's got to be back in the office. Um, you've got uh, generational differences between people like myself whose entire careers have been spent working in an office. Uh, that's kind of, for us, what work's all about. Uh, from a generation that actually I've got new guys who are coming in who have only ever worked, you know, they, they graduated during the pandemic and basically never worked in an office. And so they don't know how to work in an office and you've got to teach them how to work in an office if they're going to come into an office. So it's a really interesting time uh, for figuring out uh, on some of these terms and conditions. Um, so career development I've talked about, but benefits, particularly shareholding, is another good one. Why is somebody going to stay with your company? Well, probably if they own a slice of your company, they might care a whole lot more. Okay, so I'd suggest that shareholding, making sure everybody has a, a share in the success of the company. So if the company is successful, they are successful. And it's got to make a material difference to them. You know, chucking somebody a few shares and thinking it's going to make any difference when the shares are worth nothing, it isn't going to work. Um, so you've got to actually share the value in the company. So you've looked at your terms and conditions. Uh, you're still having a problem. What else can you do? Upskilling and reskilling. Uh, this is an interesting one. Essentially what I mean, will you look for employees in your company who you can retrain into other areas of business where you're struggling to get the staff? Um, it it kind of does work, but you've got to identify the employees who have potential. You know, not everybody in your company is necessarily going to make you know, a new developer. <laughs> it doesn't always work that way. They might not even be interested in it, oddly enough. Um, but so you've got to identify the employees with potential to go and do the job. And the problem is, if you then move them from where they're at, you've then you've got to fill the position somewhere else. You're just moving the problem around the company. Um, great if you can recruit somebody into that. Um, but actually, it does result in really loyal employees. I've upskilled a couple of people in our company where I've identified skill sets that they had uh, and opportunities in the business. Um, and the net result is that, you know, they're still with us 10 to 12 years later. So, yeah, it does produce really loyal employees on the whole. I haven't found that when you do that, the people then just take their skill set and move somewhere else. Um, but if you've got to grow significantly, I'm afraid that isn't going to work. <laughs> so upskilling and reskilling is still going to be a problem. And if you've got to grow significantly and you're having problems attracting uh, people from the local area, you're going to have to look at some other techniques. So other things that we've done. Outsourcing. <laughs> Let's give the problem to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to outsource. So outsourcing, uh, outsourcing and consultants, paying another company to deliver it. So here's my project. Uh, basically, I want you to deliver this. Basically, you go and get the staff, and uh, it's your problem. We'll just pay you to go and deliver it. That, that's kind of outsourcing. Uh, consultants is a slight variation, of course. Uh, consultants, you supplement your own staff internally. So you, you can bring consultants in. They work with your staff uh, but, of course, they're paid as a consultant, which inevitably means they're going to be paid more than your existing staff. Um, but then that's not their salary, as I keep trying to explain to people when you work as a consultant, and I worked as a consultant for many years, uh, that's my turnover. It's my business turnover. It's not my salary. 
<laughs> All right, that's the reason why you pay them more. Um, so how does that work in practice? Um, actually, sometimes it can work really well. I'm not saying that outsourcing doesn't work. I've outsourced projects and been successful or moderately successful. Um, so I did outsource uh, work to, uh, through another company that we were using. They were doing a mixture. They were providing consultants uh, that came into our organization uh, to help us do some development work on a project. Uh, and we also outsourced some of it. And it worked OK. We got from A to B. Um, we had to do a fairly significant rewrite of the software before we could go live with it. Um, but, <laughs> but we got there. You know, we, we got there. Um, and I've used consultants very successfully, actually, in the business. But a few things on those, uh, basically, when you're using consultants or you're outsourcing, it's not their business. They don't have a long-term commitment to you, all right? And that affects the culture and the ethos, um, and it can affect the quality of what's, go uh, of what's being developed. So um, that's been my experience. Um, it is, is easier to secure them because, as I said, you, know, you go, go to an organization, they've got you know, a dozen consultants that they can put on your project immediately, and it sounds great, and we'll, we'll get them going and we'll get, get delivering. And, and uh, basically, it can, can work well, but it only really works well where you've got a peak in workload. So I need something delivered, and once it's delivered, it's gone, and that's it. I can get rid of them again, and then basically I don't need that quantity of staff. But if you're looking for a long-term solution, outsourcing and consultants doesn't do it. I've used consultants, um, so we had a lot of consultants in our business uh, in a post-pandemic uh, environment, and the reason was, was we weren't actually sure whether or not business was actually going to continue at the level that it was, so we brought in the consultants, uh, and basically they helped us deliver the workload uh, whilst we figured out whether or not the peak in workload was sustained or whether it was going to drop off or not. It didn't drop off, so we basically have slowly and progressively over the last two years replaced the consultants with permanent staff. Um, so consultants can work well, um, but you just have to accept the fact that you're going to pay a premium for the privilege. Okay. So I've used those. It's worked successfully. Nearshoring and offshoring, alternative solutions. What's the difference? Well, nearshoring, uh, setting up operations in neighboring countries. Um, whereas offshoring is setting up your operations in countries which are not close to home. Um, by setting up operations, what do I mean? I mean you are going to set up a company entity, register a company somewhere else, and you will have to recruit not only your development staff, but the infrastructure to support those development staff. So who's going to do the admin, the office management, the HR, the legal, the accountancy? Everything goes with running a business, OK? Um, so it's a long-term investment. That doesn't mean to say it's expensive, by the way. <laughs> um, so it actually uh, can be cheaper than uh, going ahead and bringing consultants into your existing organization. It might even be cheaper than growing your own head office local Cambridge uh, development group. Um, but it's a long-term investment. Um, so UK nearshoring. Uh, I did do quite a bit of, of research into uh, nearshoring. I actually looked at the Highlands of Scotland at one time. Uh, I spent some time uh, looking at the incentives, the grants that we could get for the highlands and islands, um, and uh, we came very close to doing it. Um, so you can actually get grants. It's always worth looking at what you can get grants for, um, and uh, the highlands and islands uh, will actually give you grants to set up in certain key areas up in the highlands of Scotland. May not necessarily be where you want to put the operation, but you will get a grant to do it. Um, and then you've got to attract the staff in, of course. But once you've got the staff in in those uh, types of locations, they're likely to remain loyal uh, you know, for nothing else because there aren't any other technology companies that do quite what you do in the area. So you're much more likely to be able to retain them. Um, we, didn't have, we didn't actually go ahead in the Highlands of Scotland. That's actually mainly because we were a public company. And so what we had access to in the way of grants was actually quite limited. Um, and it, for us, it, it just didn't work as a financial exercise. There, by the time we looked at the cost 
of flying our staff up and down to the highlands of Scotland in order to do all of the education and to make sure things were running smoothly and put all of those costs in. It really didn't add up for us, but it might for you and it is worth looking at. And there will be other areas of the UK uh, where you've got the technical skills, uh, you can attract people in, therefore, to work there. Um, so if you look at other areas in the UK, um, you should be able to find some other areas where you can attract people in, but those are getting fewer as the skills get shorter. Um, then other areas near, uh, you know, so if you look at the uh, areas around, we've looked at a number of areas, so we... Uh, you know, have tried to use uh, consultants. Typically, most of you probably have worked with um, either Ukrainian consultants, Polish consultants. Uh, Romania is another area that we looked at. Um, so looking at Eastern Europe um, and uh, basically looking at setting up operations there. The problem that you've got with a lot of those is that they're now mature countries. And therefore, what's happened is the advantages of setting up there was usually I've got the availability of highly technical staff, um, and I'm actually going to have some cost savings that actually make it worth me setting up an operation there and all of the other overheads that go with it. Um, that's less so now. We found the margins in doing that were much less. By the time we added in the other overheads, uh, it wasn't quite so attractive. Um, so it might solve a problem, but what you're seeing uh, is basically the gap between UK salaries and Eastern European salaries have closed significantly, uh, and the economics don't work nearly so well. But they may still solve a problem, because if you're having problems getting staff in the UK and you can get the problems in other countries, you can get those staff in other countries, just because the economics, you know, just because you're not saving money is not a reason not to do it. Um, there still actually may be a good reason to do it. So I wouldn't rule any of those out yet, um, but don't expect to save money in doing them. Um, so that's the main reason I, I, you know, when I've done a lot of this, I haven't done nearshoring, um, but I have looked at offshoring, and we are doing offshoring. So offshoring. Um, I'm going to share a few tips on offshoring, um, but offshoring, so setting up our operations elsewhere. Um, so uh, Africa as an offshoring. Uh, if you look at the hotspots, the technical uh, hotspots, basically my recommendations for areas to look at are Egypt, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa, um, down the African continent. I'll come to why the African continent, the continent in a moment. Um, but offshoring basically in any of those is worth investigating. Um, US, if you're in the US, I don't recommend, by the way, you offshore uh, if you're a UK-based company and you're looking to set up another operation to offshore it somewhere in South America. Um, I'll come to why in a moment. Uh, but if you actually have uh, US operations already and development teams out in the US and you're having those same issues out in the US, not being able to get the staff and you're looking to offshore to support uh, development from your US uh, hub, uh, then looking in South America, uh, areas such as Colombia, uh, Mexico, Brazil, uh, are all quite attractive to set up there. Why? Why have I picked those two Time areas? Zones. Sorry? Time zones. Time zones. I like your thinking. It is. <laughs> Time zones is one. Okay. My success criteria for offshoring. The first thing is make sure they are technical hotspots and they do actually have the technical skills. Otherwise, it's a non-starter. <laughs> so make sure they've got the technical competency. The second one, language, is one I learned the hard way. Um, you know, we have technical conversations all of the time. If you're sitting in a sprint stand-up and struggling to communicate and people are miscommunicating, or you're trying to do this with project managers because they're the only people that speak fluent English, uh, and then they're having to translate to the developers, a lot gets lost in that whole process. Um, so I'd make sure that English uh, is... It doesn't have to be a first language, but make sure there's very good fluency in English uh, either that or your fluency in Spanish, whatever language you're going to require to work in those countries, is good. Um, so make sure you don't have the language barriers. Time zone. <laughs> Time zone. Okay. I cannot overemphasize how important it is. And that's why when I said, if you're going to be in the UK, you want a time slice that goes down, not across. So that basically when you get up in the morning and come into work and you want your sprint stand-up meeting you'd actually like to be able to have it at the same time, not at the end of the day, but let's all do it at the beginning of the day. 
Um, so time zone is important. Uh, my golden rule is really about plus or minus two hours. That's it. Well, of course, you know, for us it's plus two hours. You ain't going minus two hours unless you, you, know, you can find somewhere in the Atlantic that works for you. That's great. Um, it's the reason why uh, you know, if you're a UK operation and you're trying to expand, I wouldn't recommend doing it in South America. Uh, is the time zone difference is going to make it difficult to do. Um, so when your overlap isn't significant, then you've got less time to actually resolve the problems between the two teams. It's not impossible, but it is difficult. The last one is culture. Understand the culture of the area you're operating in. Uh, so if the culture basically isn't relatively similar, you're going to have to understand that culture very well. You probably will get into difficulties. Um, so make sure that you know, their sense of humor is quite similar to ours. You know, if you're British, you understand sarcasm. And make sure the culture understands sarcasm. Uh, or or brief, your, brief your team appropriately. But everything to do with management culture as well. Um, you know, it's really important to understand uh, the differences between uh, the different nations and the different cultures. Uh, I always uh, have a laugh. Um, I've worked for American companies uh, for, for a number of years. Um, and, it, and never a truer word was, was spoken when they said basically, you know, we're, we're two nations divided by the same language. Um, so, you know, they, they don't share our sense of humor normally. Uh, they don't necessarily share our same culture, and you've just got to understand the differences in the way they operate and, and be able to navigate that. But those are my four things that I learned the hard way. <laughs> if you get those four things right, you've got a very good chance of being successful when you're offshoring. So, in summary, there is a global crisis, and it isn't going away. Um, so if you haven't got problems recruiting right now, I'm very happy for you, but I think you're going to have them soon. <laughs> okay? If you haven't, by all means, come and talk to me and tell me what you're doing that I'm not. But we've, got, we've, we've had problems recruiting. And that's mainly, as I said, because we were trying to double the size of our development workforce in about three months. Um, so basically, we had to do massive investments. We had to find a way to do it, and the, we, just, we just couldn't do it in the UK. Um, there have been advantages for us in, in we've offshored, um, and uh, we offshored in South Africa. Um, but uh, in terms of offshoring, yes, we've, we've had some financial advantages in doing so, but that wasn't really the driver. The driver was we just have to grow our business, um, and basically, you know, we needed to find somewhere we could do that. Um, so offshoring has worked for us, uh, but we've also used consultants uh, in a stepping stone towards offshoring, and that's actually worked well for us as well. Uh, I do recommend if you're going to use consultants to get a partner to help you find those people. You know, if you find good uh, recruitment consultants, stay with them, <laughs> um, because there are a lot of bad recruitment consultants out there. We've all used them, you know, the, we all get the phone calls from them on a regular basis, and they'll all tell us their staff are wonderful and how they can find the right people, and then you interview them and you find you've just wasted your time. Um, so um, basically, uh, don't, don't not use consultants, but as I said, take, you use your consultants to take peaks off of things, don't use consultants for long term. Um, and other than that, those four things, keep those in mind if you're, if you're offshoring. Actually, keep them in if you're actually uh, offshoring or um, basically nearshoring <laughs> um, or basically any type of outsourcing. Keep those four in mind <laughs> when you're outsourcing. I have to say, I talked about outsourcing. I outsourced, we had some, some guys in India. We've still got guys, guys in India that we work with. Um, but it's much harder when you've got these time zones. The Indians are actually great, by the way. They, they do seem to work all round the clock, and they work very hard. You've just got to know how to use them on the appropriate projects. Um, but, uh, but basically, watch those four factors uh, any time you're setting up something new or working remotely and so on. Um, that's it, short and sweet. Um, so if anybody wants to talk to me uh, uh, you know, about solving some of these uh, issues, if you're not responsible, by the way, for, for recruiting and solving these types of challenges, that's fantastic. But that's today. In five years' time, you might well be responsible for it, and the situation is going to be worse. Thanks. I'll probably be retired. It won't be my problem. Um, uh, but you'll be facing exactly the same things. You'll be digging out the presentation going, what did Ricky say about this? <laughs> um, so... Uh, 
uh, good luck. Um, but yes, by all means, talk to me if you'd like to talk about any of these you know, in more detail. Uh, if I've completely bored you uh, on you know, some of the management problems that we, that we have to solve, um, you can come and talk to me about flying. I'm a flying instructor at the Cambridge Aero Club, so you can come and talk to me about flying. And if flying bores you and you still would like a chat, come and talk to me about beer. Um, as yeah. some of you will know, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I run a microbrewery as well, so uh, I have, have lots of experience in brewing beer. Um, so thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. That's it. <laughs>